Yes, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at uh, this meeting. Um, so the title of my talk has changed a tiny bit. Um, um, and the reason for this is because I wanted, in fact, to highlight that, um, that we've in, we're in the process of really, truly trying to understand what are the deep down fingerprints and dynamical reasons for why something like asymptotic safety in a fundamental, say, four-dimensional quantum field theory might exist. There have been signs out recently that structural dynamical reasons for this might exist, but um, we've been looking into that, trying to nail it a bit deeper, and today I will be reporting about the progress we have been made along those lines. Now, many of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, many of the results have been achieved together with my students, Andrew Bond and Tuba Buyuk, based, both of which are sitting here in the audience and uh, are present. Good. So, what is the motivation for looking into this? For me, the motivation is definitely the standard model of particle physics. Yes, it's a totally beautiful local quantum field theory it describes all those fundamental interactions we know, perhaps except gravity. Okay. It has been verified with extraordinary precision. Yes. Um, it's really a beautiful theory. It contains all the degrees of freedom we know up to now, including uh, very recently the arrival of the Higgs. Yes. Now, from a theory perspective, what theoreticians do totally like with that type of theory is um, it's predictive. It's a perturbatively renormalizable theory. It has predictive power. And we see this predictive power confirmed day by day now that the LHC is running. OK. Now, of course, not everything is beautiful and shiny with the standard model. We also know that there are a large number of intriguing open challenges. So for once, we do know that the standard model ultimately can't be the final fundamental answer. It intrinsically has built in and highest energy scale beyond which it is no longer going to be valid. And even if this weren't the case, there are still many questions from a theory point of view, which we would like uh, to have an answer for when it comes to standard model physics. For example, what is it that exactly determines the physics of the electroweak scale? Right? How comes we have so huge hierarchies in the masses of particles? Okay. Um, and ultimately, um, what are the missing pieces? which we haven't seen yet, but which hopefully would complement the standard model towards higher energies so that we would actually have predictivity up to ideally the Planck scale minimally or possibly beyond. So from that angle, there are many challenges. And many of you, including myself, have certainly also been interested in exploring this at the inter hoppla, at the interface with gravity. Yes. So the big question is somehow for a theoretician, uh, what would be uh, useful directions which we now can follow? So in model building, we know directions. So a lot of structural directions had been given to us, motivated by symmetry, supersymmetry, for example. OK, ideas to overcome uh, challenges in explaining hierarchies within the standard model. Uh, but as we know by data from LHC thus far, this uh, has not necessarily been totally successful. Okay? So it might be a good question to rethink the uh, landscape of directions. Now, speaking of directions, um, we all know how important directions are, and when we arrived here at the conference, um, we've been given directions. 
yes, namely this here, we, we all arrived, right, and we, we, we were invited to appreciate clear directions when, uh, when we were looking to find the path to the registration disk, okay, so clearly directions are important, yes. Um, now, if we take this um, as an allegory for the standard model, of course, you might wonder what are the directions we could follow there, and clearly there is one direction, a total light tower of a direction which has been given to us already back in 73, which has been this important discovery of asymptotic freedom. Asymptotic freedom is a deep down dynamical mechanism which can explain how fundamental theories remain predictive to highest energies. So it really is a very important cornerstone, not only in the understanding and construction of the standard model, but in providing ideas on how to perhaps go beyond. Now, I have to review this because it is so important. I mean, asymptotic freedom is uh, so extraordinarily well established by experiment. For good reasons, Nobel Prizes have been given for these discoveries. Yes, but not only this, I mean it is, as I said, an important building block in the understanding of um, constructing models beyond the standard model. Okay, and so what we do know, so the hard results we have are summarized here. The hard results uh, about achieving predictivity up to highest energies means we do by all by all means, we do necessitate non-abelian gauge degrees of freedom. Without non-abelian gauge fields, there is absolutely no way we can achieve predictivity to highest energies. And the difficult customers, of course, here are the scalar fields, who by themselves would not be asymptotically free, but also you cover interactions, all those things we do know very well from standard model physics. It is only because of non-abelian gauge fields that there is an, an avenue according to which such theories might become completely asymptotically free. Of course, there are some conditions under which, uh, which need to be fulfilled, and as I said, these conditions are not fulfilled even if we were to be taking the hypercharge out of the standard model. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is to open up perhaps a second avenue to offer directions on how we might think about uh, completing the standard model beyond um, the physics we know for now. And this avenue I would like to discuss is related to the idea of asymptotic safety um, presumably, uh, some of you have come across uh, this concept. Let me quickly mention what it is about. The centrally new idea, which makes it perhaps different from asymptotic freedom, is to allow yourself to think that couplings at highest energies might not necessarily vanish. So this is what you normally get in asymptotic freedom, but now we want to consider a scenario where this is not necessarily happening. Still, the important ingredient is going to be that we would need an interacting fixed point, or else people will have difficulties believing that such a setting, in fact, is fundamental and predictive really up to highest energies. Now, if this were to be the case, it would offer a set of opportunities to rethink ultraviolet completions. It may or may not be realized in nature. This is something which we still, of course, would then have to figure out in quantitative detail. Yes, But at least it would offer an alternative. Now, quite some of my motivation for working in this direction relates to some recent work which I've done with Francesco Zanino, who reported about that uh, two days ago. Okay, so um, but a model where actually we, we managed to figure out in some example theory that uh, this type of asymptotic safety, in fact, is realized in exactly solvable models. 
So the big question here is, was that just a curiosity of mathematics? Or is there more structure underneath actually opening up an entire window of opportunities for us to look into? I would like to do, what I would like to do now is to show you that indeed there is an entire window of opportunity hidden underneath that result. Okay, so what I will do is for you today is I will discuss all I will derive and discuss and analyze all weakly coupled fixed points in general gauge theories. You name the gauge group, you name the field content, yes, and I can tell you now, we can tell you the conditions which must be satisfied so that this theory either has or not, is not having interacting asymptotically safe UV fixed points. We will derive strict conditions, including no-go theorems for asymptotic safety. Now, this table is perhaps the asymptotic safety counterpart to the table I've shown to you a minute ago. Namely, this is the summary table, in fact, of all results. So what I want to do is I will explain you in some depth how these results come about, but I wanted to show you those results in the first place. The results look like this. There are a set of no-go theorems. Okay? So there are a set of very general gauge theories with simple or abelian gauge group. No matter what the fermionic or meta content is, they will never be able to develop weakly coupled asymptotically safe fixed points. However, and this is the crucial point, as soon, and this is what we will show, as soon as Yukawa interactions are present, we can formulate certain conditions which need then to be met so that these totally general, simple or abelian, semi-simple or product gauge series with abelian factors have ultraviolet asymptotically safe fixed point. Okay? Good. So let's see how these results are coming about. Now, and to see that, I am going to start little by little. So we first start discussing just a simple gauge theory with a gauge coupling um, G. So we introduce little alpha, and that will, is going to be the coupling we will be mostly interested in. Now we speak weak coupling, so we can do perturbation theory. That's the territory in which we are going to be operating. So in perturbation theory, we write down the beta function, which up to two loop order is given here. Yes, and so we see the one loop coefficient, which we tend to call minus b, and we see the two loop coefficient, which we call c. Now in a general gauge, simple gauge theory, b and c can be expressed in terms of the quadratic Casimir of the gauge group in the adjoint, and then it's going to depend on the fermionic and the scalar meta content. They will contribute according to their Dinkin index um, um, under the representation um, of the gauge group. And very similarly, there's a second coefficient, c, the two-loop coefficient, which also has fermion contribution, scalar contribution if the scalars are charged, and a contribution coming from the gauge fields with the opposite sign. Now, in order to get a weakly coupled fixed point, what we do need is that one loop and two loop cancel out, and that this cancellation parametrically happens in a regime where the fixed point itself is still small so that we can trust perturbation theory. So this will be our conditions. Now, when you look into this expression, you s immediately see the following obvious things. Firstly, both B and C can have either sign. It's going to depend on the specifics of your meta content. If you have a lot of meta, the meta fields dominate and B is going to be negative. 
Now, if B is negative, the one-loop coefficient is positive, meaning you've just lost asymptotic freedom. Conversely, if you have a li little matter, then the gauge fields dominate and asymptotic uh, freedom persists. Perhaps similarly with the coefficient C, you have a competition between matter, which add up positively, and the gauge fields. So one would have to, you know, throw a more careful look into this theory to understand what the hell is going on and what are its possible fixed points. Now, what is already known for very, very many years, of course, is that these theories can have um, infrared fixed points, provided that B, one loop and two loop coefficients, are positive. If they are positive, their ratio is positive, we have a physical fixed point, which is the famous caswell banks sachs fixed point. Furthermore, it's an infrared, low energy fixed point. How do we know that? Simple, because B is positive. So when B is positive, it means the theory is asymptotically free. The asymptotically free fixed point, the Gaussian, is the ultraviolet fixed point. So the other one, the new interacting one, is therefore an infrared fixed point. So the question is, actually, is it perhaps possible to have both B and C negative? Because if we have B and C negative, then the corresponding fixed point would indeed be ultraviolet. So up to now, there have been no examples of this type, okay, but uh, the ha a hard answer was missing. And now, in order to progress with this, we decided to rewrite the two-loop coefficient in a slightly different form. So what we did here is we wrote the two-loop coefficient by exploiting, by inserting the one-loop coefficient in it. So we've been replacing the quadratic Casimir by the one-loop coefficient and reordered terms. So it's the very same expression, but written in a slightly different way. So let's see what we can learn by this. So the first thing we learn is that if we lose asymptotic freedom, meaning B being ne becoming negative, then this term here is going to be positive. B negative, so its contribution is positive. So this is a term which is manifestly positive if asymptotic freedom is gone out of the window. Then we see there are two remaining terms coming either from the fermions or the scalars. The first of them, you can just look at it, it's manifestly positive definite. So no matter what your fermionic content is, they are going to contribute positively to the two-loop coefficient. Okay? So we already have a first result, and actually this result has been discovered by Caswell back in 74. Yes? If we have a gauge theory coupled to fermions only, then there is no way this theory is going to have a weakly interacted, interacting ultraviolet fixed point. Impossible. Right? The right-hand side is always going to be positive at the instant where B has become negative. Now let's look into the scalars. The scalar contribution, as you can see from this expression, is not manifestly positive definite. Now what does it mean? It means that if we manage to find a gauge group, where the quadratic Casimir of our scalars is smaller than 1 over 11, then you know the quadratic Casimir in the adjoint, then in fact the contribution by the scalars would have the negative sign. And in that case, C, the two-loop coefficient, could potentially become negative, in which case an interacting fixed point may arise and may become physical. Okay? So, let's see how that goes. If we want to understand or exclude this case, we must know whether uh, 
this relation can be achieved in any gauge theory. So once we realized this, Andrew and myself were scratching our head and we thought, oh yeah, that must be totally easy. Let's, let's walk over to the library, you know, let's get out some dusty books about Lie algebras and representation theory. Somewhere there the answer must be. Obviously, all the things we know about Lie algebras, right? But in fact, we were digging for a little while and shying away from doing an actual computation by ourselves, uh, for, um, but then realized, no, somehow, apparently, people have not looked or didn't felt that this is an interesting or important question. We didn't manage to find the result. So we had to sit down and do uh, this analysis by our own. Um, so how, how do you do it? We used some... Um, the idea which helped us in the end is realizing that um, uh, we can always express, of course, the quadratic Casimir uh, in terms of uh, a highest weight vector because these are one-to-one -one related to uh, uh, identify the irreducible representations under our gauge group. So this gives us some formal expression for the quadratic Casimir in terms of these highest weight vectors. This is expressed as some scalar product, formally speaking, in this space of weight vectors for your representation. But the thing which is known about this scalar product is that this scalar product has some metric in it, and this metric, these matrices, uh, these metrics are known explicitly for all um, Lie algebras. So, in fact, we can exploit this knowledge and analyze um, which representations lead to the smallest Casimir and what that ca smallest Casimir at the end of the day is. So, the answer is this. We classified it for all simple algebras, and what you get, you know, you, well, you compute the smallest quadratic Casimir, and the quantity which ultimately is important is the ratio between the smallest quadratic Casimir and the Casimir in the adjoint. This ratio is what we call chi, and it's given in over here. Now, um, as you know, yes, uh, quadratic Casimirs, of course, they can easily take very large values. And, and, and in fact, if you look into it, there's not, not a lot of monotonicity in, in, in its size when you run through you know, your rep possible representations. But what came out for the smallest Casimir in any Lie algebra is the following. It is always, always, related to the irreducible representation with the smallest dimension. And that turns out to be always one of the fundamental representations of your gauge group. Okay? So that's the result. So then we can compute chi, and we can also make a nice plot. Yes? Um, so this is like, good. Here you see uh, the classical Lie algebras like, and, and their n dependence and the exceptional Lie algebras. Okay? And no matter what you do, however, and that's perhaps the central result here, um, the quadratic Casimir in units of the adjoint is bounded from below. It's bounded from below by 3 over 8. So we now know that's the piece of information we got from representation theory, and we can now come back to our main line of reasoning and realize that, in fact, we have no-go theorems. First no-go theorem is we should have had this in order to be able to generate an ultraviolet fixed point, but it so turns out we have that. Now, what are the implications? The implications are truly far-reaching because the implications tell you that if B the one loop coefficient, or minus b is the one loop coefficient. If b is negative, so if we lose in any gauge theory, if we lose asymptotic freedom, then no matter what, the two loop coefficient is going to be positive. Proven. Okay? So therefore, we have a no-go theorem, meaning that if we only have gauge interactions, 
There's no way of ever achieving an interacting UV fixed point. End of story. Now let's see how this can be generalized. Okay, so you might think, well, let me try to get away of this no-go theorem by circumnavigating it through additional couplings. So the first thing you might think of is, let me introduce more gauge couplings. So I write down, yes, maybe I, I think of a semi-simple gauge theory with product gauge groups. Okay, I have more than one gauge coupling. And this is how now my beta function would be looking like. Okay, so for each gauge group, I have a one-loop coefficient. I have the two-loop coefficients, CAA, the diagonal one, which we discussed a minute ago. And the new gimmick, however, which is now coming into play, are the off-diagonal contributions, CAB, the mixing between uh, the gauge groups. Okay? So, if I had a theory like that, what is the interacting fixed point? Well this theory has interacting fixed point provided that this simple linear equation has solutions for which alpha star remains positive for zero. Okay, this would then be the fixed points. Now, let's see what do we know about these new mixing terms. Now, first of all, the non-trivial mixing terms, we know how to write them down, so they are related again to the quadratic Casimir and the Dinkin index of the uh, uh, representation of your particles. But as you can see from the explicit expression, it is manifestly positive. These contributions are positive. So, what, does, what follows out of it? It follows that as soon as we have any gauge factor which is not asymptotically free, okay, meaning the factor BA one of them being negative, then we know by what we showed a minute ago that all diagonal contributions, so the CAA, is positive. And we see here that the off-diagonal are all positive also, so we know that all these coefficients CAB are positive for all B. What does that mean? It's a no-go theorem. Why? Think of finding a solution to this fixed point equation. We just said if BA is negative, so if we've lost in, if only in one of those gauge groups, if we've lost asymptotic freedom, BA is negative. But this equation must have a solution, but we just established that all these CABs are positive. And for a fixed point to be physical, we need alpha star to be positive. No way to have a solution as soon as B is negative. Impossible. So it's a no-go theorem. It's impossible to get that fixed point. Good. So, <clears throat> this was part one. The three no-go theorems in all generality. Yes. Uh, how not to get an asymptotically safe fixed point. So, we've seen we can gauge, take gauge couplings, we can take more gauge couplings, it doesn't work. Well, but there are two positive examples, so something must be working, so let's see what that is. First of all, you might think, well, let me try to throw more meta-couplings into it, and the natural candidate would be scalar couplings if you have scalar degrees of freedom. However, scalar couplings will never be able to help you generate a fixed point in the gauge sector. How comes? They only start contributing at the three or four loop level, depending on whether these scalars are charged or not. If they don't contribute at the two loop level, where we have the wrong sign, this then would mean that we need non-perturbatively strong effects coming from the scalars, which is not compatible with our assumption of perturbativity for now. Not saying that this is excluded, but at least it's not a possible at weak coupling. So, the final candidate we may want to look into are Yukawa couplings. Now, Yukawa couplings do contribute to the running of the gauge starting from the two-loop level. So, indeed, they will be there if we have Yukawas. So, it's important to look into them. Now, what do we know about Yukawa interactions? Okay, so think of writing down your Yukawa interactions in some 
general form, okay, why index A is now the u cover matrix of couplings, okay, uh, what is the contribution to the running of the gauge? Well, we've written it down here. It's this new term, minus 2y4. I'm adapting the notation which has been introduced by those who actually did that computation quite some time ago. Okay, and y4 is some expression, okay, which knows about the fermionic representation of your field and which knows about the Yukawa matrices. The only thing which you need to know about y is that y is positive no matter what. But see the minus sign here, okay? So the important message really is you carve couplings always slow down the running of the gauge. And even more, if you're lucky, the slowing down may be so strong that this Yukawa contribution generates a zero so that the theory is having a fixed point. Okay. Now, let's see how that could, be happen, could happen. Yes. So let's imagine that the Yukawas get a fixed point by themselves. So then y4 would be some number y4 star. So the way we can now look for a fixed point is to say, oh, okay, what this, in fact, the, the effect of the Yukawas quantitatively is that our one-loop coefficient is shifted into a one-loop coefficient B prime, which is now a different value. It takes a different value because of the Yukawa fixed point. Now, the important point here is that no matter what you do, B prime is going to be bigger than B. If this happens, what is going to be the fixed point? Well, you can clearly read it off. The fixed point would then be not B over C, but B prime over C. But as you can see, something very important has happened here. Yes? Imagine you have a theory which is not asymptotically free. Say, imagine you start with negative B. We know when B is negative, C is positive. So this fixed point B over C would not be physical. There is no such fixed point. But now that you've switched on the Yukawas, the Yukawas induce a shift, and some negative B can be turned into a positive B prime, thanks to the Yukawa interactions. Once B prime is positive, we will have an interacting, totally viable interacting ultraviolet fixed point. That's the mechanism. Good. So, you can now dig a bit more deeply and look into what is really going on in the Yukawa sector. Okay? So, for the Yukawa sector, we know its beta function. Now, we postulated that that sector has a zero, so let's see whether this is a good postulate. We know zeros of the Yukawa beta function either mean the Yukawas are zero, that's the well-known Gaussian fixed point, or the Yukawas are proportional to the gauge, yes, with some numerical proportionality constants, Ca. Now, if we exploit this piece of information, we can actually compute explicitly y star. And we will see that it is given by some number d, just related to group theoretical factors and the structure of your Yukawa sector times the gauge coupling. So, in fact, once you know that, you can equally think of the Yukawa contribution, in fact, on its null Klein, having modified, factually, the two-loop coefficient C, because this term, as we just showed, is proportional to alpha, at those points where the beta function for the Yukawas is vanishing. So, an alternative way to exactly look at the same thing is to, to realize that we have an induced shift of the two-loop term, but now the two-loop term is being made smaller because d is always a positive number. Okay? So, these are two sides of one and the same metal. Right? We would find the reliable fixed point B over C prime, which is the same fixed point as we've saw in a minute ago, except that now we have resolved 
this remaining implicit dependency. So, you see a first necessary condition for asymptotic safety. Of course, you can play now this game for semi-simple gauge theories, okay, and you will see that the same type of logic, in fact, is going through. You will find the generalized equations and, in fact, the necessary condition for asymptotic safety once again takes a very similar form, namely requiring that the shifted one-loop coefficients, once you've taken into account the effect of the Yukawas, are all positive. Now, good. So, I've explained to you how this table has come about. I would like now to use the remaining few minutes I have to indicate a few, two minutes I have to indicate a few uh, further results which we found. So, one side result which we have is, um, so I've focused a little bit on fixed points which are asymptotically safe, but at the same time, our analysis gives you a complete overview of all possible weakly interacting fixed points in gauge theories, be, be it ultraviolet or infrared one. And this is the table showing you that classification. And so in the end of the day, um, uh, maybe the central new point to be highlighted here is that, remember, we started and realized meta-content is very important to understand potential phase diagrams and phase structures of gauge theories. So the one and two loop coefficients, which do encode those things. But as it now turned out, there's a third quantity related to information coming from the Yukawa sector, right, which for simple gauge theories is this quantity C prime. And that quantity is playing an equally important role. If you were to be imagining, let's, let's, make, let's plot some phase diagram about what type of fixed points fundamentally really exist, well, then there are only four. This is the one everybody has seen because this is the Gaussian fixed point of asymptotic freedom. Right? We have a gauge coupling down here. We have few cover interactions. We have trajectories emanating out of the Gaussian. Okay, and actually entire families of asymptotically free trajectories getting out of it. But no real interacting fixed point. Now this happens if B is positive. Now, if additionally C is positive, then we also have the bank sucks fixed point sitting down here. Okay? The bank sucks fixed point exists once the Yukawas are switched off. It has an in unstable direction, so, di so trajectories get out of the sky and would run into that plane towards the infrared. Okay, these fixed points are very well known and uh, well studied in the field. Now, if additionally you also have that C prime is positive, then that means that besides the fixed point B over C, which is the bank sucks, you have the fixed point B over C prime, which is this one. A fully interacting, we call it a gauge Yukawa fixed point, because both the gauge and the Yukawa have non-trivial fixed point values. Okay. And in this setting, this fixed point acts like an infrared sink. If you have masses, of course, you still can run away from that fixed point. So this fixed point factually corresponds to a second order quantum phase transition in this type of four dimensional gauge Yukawa theory. Now, finally, uh, the opposite case, if you have lost asymptotic freedom, so if B has become negative, then the only way for heading fixed points is that, well, we know that C is positive anyway, we've proven this, but if then C prime is negative, then B over C prime gives you a reliable physical fixed point, which is this guy over here. This is all there is, because we've shown there's only one mechanism to generate that fixed point. Okay? Now, if you generalize it to semi-simple gauge theories, what is going to happen is that your phase diagrams will, in essence, be direct products of the phase diagrams I've been showing you. Okay? Now, before concluding, let me mention two extensions, and then uh, I, I will show you my concluding 
uh, slide. First extension is uh, we know that these interacting fixed points exist for simple gauge groups. We have an example. Question is, is the space of solutions populated even in the case where we have semi-simple gauge groups? Well, Andrew Bond reported about these results, so if you want to know more, please speak to him. But yes, we have hard results showing that those guys do exist. Okay. Second extension, uh, you might wonder what is going to... So I've been concerned for now only with the couplings which have marginally canonical mass dimensions, of course, those which are perturbatively renormalizable. But you might wonder and ask yourself what is going to happen if we include more complex, higher dimensional operators, higher powers in the fields, operators which normally are being considered perturbatively non-renormalizable. Well, the important result which comes out here, you need to do some technology beyond what we did for now, so we've done it with functional RG. The results are shown by Tuba on her poster, and we find that the fixed point does persist, and even more so, effective potentials remain stable as they must. Okay, so here are some of her results, which you can see in the poster. So it's time to uh, show my conclusions. Um, I try to show you how all, all weakly interacting fixed points of general gauge theories, yes, can be classified now. In this set of fixed points, there is a subset of candidate fixed points for ultraviolet completions in four-dimensional gauge you cover theories, and I've shown you necessary and sufficient conditions for these to exist. Okay. Now, in the sense of a, carb and a fingerprint for where asymptotic safety is carb coming from, the Yukawa interactions are the pivotal element. They are the only one which, in fact, can negotiate a fixed point once asymptotic freedom is lost. Okay. Now, this is offering maybe a window of opportunities to think about how particle physics models can be constructed even beyond um, the traditional paradigm of asymptotic freedom. Thank you very much. <laughs>